two pitch. Drill to center field. Bo Jackson going over, leaps and can't get it. It goes all the way to the fence. Deion Sanders blazing around second. Tabler goes over to get the ball, plays it in there, waving him home. The throw to the plate gets on by. Sanders flies over. There's a pile of bodies at the plate. And now he is safe at home. The 0-2 delivery to Pedro Guerrero. Up the middle, off the glove. Can they turn two? There's it! center field and deep, and it's gone! My ball into deep left center field, Griffey going back to the one track, leaps high in the air, and he's got it! An incredible catch by the kid! Baseball's most exciting plays are often enhanced by baseball's excitable broadcasters. But in every fan, there lives a fantasy to be the one who makes that call. And now they can. Fans can do the play-by-play -play and color of a full inning of baseball, taking home a video of their efforts and the means to prove a point. How many times has a sports fan been watching the game and saying, that announcer doesn't know what he's talking about. I can do better than that. Well, that's what fantasy play-by-play -play is. It's their chance to be the announcer of the game. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Peterson along with Robin Carr. We're set to go to the top of the third inning. The Giants with a one nothing lead over the Padres, courtesy of uh, Jose Uribe triple scoring Gary Carter with two outs in the bottom of the second. Young Eric Gunderson on the hill for the Giants, Robin. Hey, young Eric Gunderson is, by the way, an Aries. And we'll find out how much fire he has in that old fork ball today. Huh, well, pal? I'll, I'll tell you something. The way he cocks his wrist back there when he's uh, letting that ball go kind of reminds me of Rick Sutcliffe. Of course, he doesn't have the same kind of major league statistics no, as no, Sutcliffe. There his initial major league start, as a matter of fact, and this kid looks pretty impressive so far. And it's pretty cool, I'll tell you that right now. You know, Eric Anderson looking good, and he's a pretty cool little dude, I think. He's cute. I was working at a radio station in San Francisco uh, that was broadcasting the Oakland A's games, and the vice president, Andy Dolich, called me one day and said, how do we get the fans involved with the game through broadcasting? Think about it and call me next week came by and I said it's called fantasy play-by-play -play. you get to announce an inning of the game we record it on the tape and you take it home with you this season fantasy play-by-play is in seven ballparks across the country we got the Yankees St. Louis Cardinals Minnesota Twins Pittsburgh Pirates Seattle Mariners Texas Rangers and the San Francisco Giants anybody can do fantasy play-by-play -play because we all grew up listening to the ball game on the radio you know and the pitch he got it I of it. oh I'm so excited my pen just went all over my face my palms are sweating. I gotta change my shorts in just one minute. We want to loosen people up because some people get really intimidated by a microphone. So we just say, come on, it's fun, relax. And we tell them, look, obscenity encouraged, profanity preferred. Have a blast. Do whatever you want. No one's gonna hear the tape unless you play it for them. And you know, I really love this job. It has a lot of fringe benefits and I'm starting to really enjoy it. Especially this last inning. You know, the game's gotten a little more intense and my adrenaline's been going a little more than it usually has. Oh, and they're walked. Oh, this makes man. it even worse for me because, you know what? After drinking two beers, guess where I have to go? But don't worry about it. You keep on Lisa, take over. <laughs> You notice how Giles stays in that box all the time? You see how he crouches down real low? Crouches. Yeah. Crouches. Look at this guy. He's got a butt that sticks out. Look at that. It's a bubble butt. It's quick. like a bubble I'm butt. Yeah. Here, ladies. It's Definitely like bubble gum. <laughs> bubble yum. <bubble. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Let's take a pin. Let's see if it pops. <laughs> Robinson's beginning to sweat out there in the mound. You can see the beads of perspiration dripping off that ugly red beard of his. Yeah, that is kind of a homely thing, isn't it? <laughs> I've seen some people do fantasy play-by-play -play that have been amazing. What's real interesting, they've been about 12 years old. The kids are great uh, because that's all they do is sit home and do play-by-play -play when they're playing or when they're watching the game. Those are the ones with the most potential. Jones looks, checks, and pitches. Oh, it is swing! It's good! Oh, my God! It's off the hefty bag! It's off the hefty bag! One run will score! Herbeck has a double! Can you take any position that I want? Really? Yes, I can. All right. 
right. Because it's my show. I guess. And here comes Tracy Jones. Isn't he crazy? Who's crazy? Crazy Jones. No, not Crazy Jones. Tracy Jones. Girls, uh. find up in the pitch ball. Strike one, good pitch. <laughs> One of my favorite things that happens is the father-son combination. A guy comes in, and it doesn't matter how old the father is or how old the son is, but we've had father and son combinations do because they've been talking about baseball all their lives. And here they get to do it on tape. So the dad takes it home. We have this great one of this little kid singing, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Take hey, me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and apple jacks. It's a shame, that's right. One, two, three strikes, you're out. And your ball. ball game. All right, high five, you got it. Even Fred has found the time to get behind the mic for his own stab at play-by-play -play perfection. Here we go, with the 0-2. yet to see anybody walk out of a fantasy play-by-play -play booth that didn't have a smile on their face. It's just a thrill. So many fans that can't play baseball, but they get to be involved with the game. And that's the greatest part of fantasy play-by-play. -play. It's just a blast. Play-by-play -play on the radio. Play-by-play -play on the radio. Play-by-play. -play. I saw it on What is the pellet that they are throwing to each other? That'll be a walk. Why is he? Why if it's a walk? Is he running? Yeah, he's in a hurry. I he's see. in a hurry. Play by play. I saw it on the rain. It is going. It is going. It is gone. You are in the news base runners and the geometric problems they encounter when the straight line between bases throws them a curve. Reigns did not leave the batter's box and the ball drops in. Inexplicably, Reigns hit the ball. I don't know if he broke the bat or what, and he just stood in the batter's box. Then jogged down to first base when he saw the ball drop in. That's the sign of a real slump. Sometimes base runners can leave announcers almost speechless. Boy, he went to the second base with a vengeance, didn't he? Look at this swing. Look at this. He hits it on the first bounce. This has got to make a blooper reel, this whole play. There you see it. Anderson knows there's no play. Look at this slide. Came up just a bit short. <laughs> he wasn't all he was almost not moving fast enough to slide. Not moving fast enough is the bane of most base runners, which leads them to improvise. Sharply to Reynolds. They go to second for one, back to first, not in time, the ball gets away. Here comes McFarland to the plate. He is out. It took a while. It's the most unusual double play. It took forever. Most plays that take forever aren't successful. Most. Flying around second on his way to third, this kind of being waved to the plate by an off the tunnel. Hatcher at third, and he's going to get up and score as the ball gets by Matt Williams. Hatcher may not make it alive. It's there somewhere. <laughs> Ever the showman, Mickey Hatcher. He's 11 to 1. Look at that. Look at that. Well, you want to 
see this one again? Wasn't that bad a throw? It just base runner kind of yeah. all at the same time as an etcher who did not stumble on purpose. <laughs> Barely made it. <laughs> I haven't seen anything like that since uh, you coming back to the hotel last night. <laughs> Not often you see a guy swim on dry land, is it? <laughs> there he is, mimicking himself. Oh, we don't even have to show a replay again. Watcher will do it for us. Our stat of the week deals with the speed of one Otis Nixon, who steals now more than ever. There goes Nixon to third, a steal for Otis, number 29. There he goes. Stolen base for Otis Nixon. Nixon is en route vers le troisième coussin. Il arrive à temps. Breaking Lake's throw will be late. Stolen base, Otis Nixon. He is almost a cinch to go. He's going on the first pitch. Grissom takes a strike. Throw down will never get Nixon in with a stolen base. And keep an eye on him at second. He's liable to go to third. In the tail of Nixon's tape, the only gap is with the bat. Welcome to Tinker Field, home of the Orlando Sunrays, a double-A team in the Southern League, and the home of Blind Date Night. Well, there are a lot of unattached people in Orlando, and, and the big problem is just getting to know each other. And, uh, you know, rather than the single bar scene, uh, why not beautiful Tinker Field? Then the problem arose, you know, how are we going to go about doing this? And then it hit. We sell the odd-numbered seats to the gentlemen, the even-numbered seats to the unattached women, and we have Alaka Zang, it's magic, blind date night. The Sunrays spare no expense in providing the trappings for romance. And for some, the magic in the air is impossible to resist. So I came out here to have a good time, meet people, and you know, who knows, maybe meet the right person, who knows. For others, well, there will be other nights to tinker forever with chance. I shaved, that should have helped. <laughs> he, got, he got lucky, I guess, we just got here too late. <laughs> Luck was rare this night, but all in all, they could have been in Philadelphia. Well, we did this in Philadelphia, and we had blind date there up in the upper deck of, of the Spectrum at a 76ers game. The results were, were rather interesting as you look at it from a sociological viewpoint. 55 single men showed up and one single woman. I don't know what that says about Philadelphia. I don't know whether we can read something into that. I'll leave that for your imagination. Once you hit 30, it's all over. You can wear a pen at your... The symmetry of baseball implies that everything has its place, but places can get lost in the crowd. Dave Smith uh, was probably down the runway or maybe... House. They sent out for him, and now he's searching for his glove. He can't find his glove. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> he's always prepared. But this time, it catches him off guard. Probably his guy has hit it. Probably some of the guys in the dugout got hit his glove. Well, the home plate umpire said something to him, Mike Winters. Larry Anderson had his glove all the way down <laughs> in the <laughs> all far corner of the dugout, hiding it from him. <laughs> he was going to use another one, but now he gets the old familiar glove. It's an endless game of lost and found. 
While pitchers try to find their groove, the baseball hitters love to lose. High fly ball deep to right center. Davis chasing. Home run, Darryl Strawberry. But once a ball is truly lost with a titanic hit, the strangest thing then happens. They start anew to look for it. Ronnie Darling will try to get that ball back. Searching. It's one of the guards <laughs> telling him it's under that car. It's something guys are born with. They can't go home at night until they find the ball. Yeah, they get their expensive cars parked out there behind that scoreboard. Dow does some damage, I'm sure, to those cars. No offense, but if someone loses a baseball, you don't send somebody from Yale to find it. You need a guy from Brooklyn. John Franco joining Ron Darling. It's almost like the Little Leagues when you would lose the ball in the woods. Guys Everybody had to yeah. go where you couldn't continue play. They will have the whole ball club out there. How about that? Uh, they're either shopping for a car or looking for the ball, <laughs> one or the other. That's some pretty expensive talent chasing down baseballs. Is it just us, or is there something very strange about this picture? Look at these two guys. Over there? Did they say Simon says it's over there or what? <laughs> at least our intrepid foragers were not distracted by the sand pile. But this was getting out of hand. So in an effort to appease the lost boys of baseball, they sent a guard to try and trick them. Okay, we found the culprit. Yeah, Ron Darling, John Frankel, on a wild goose chase. And the guard, that, that can't be the ball. Probably a batting practice ball. But patience is a virtue. And in this game of lost and found, Chalk one up for the perseverance of Yale. Darryl Strawberry tattoos a home run. His teammates are in pursuit of the ball. And Ron Darling finds it. All right. Dick Raditz was a bullpen power for Boston, a nasty boy of the 60s who knew his calling from the start. As far as I know, I may be wrong about this, but I think I was probably, if not the first, one of the first relief pitchers to be groomed in the minor leagues to pitch relief in the big leagues. If you weren't good enough to start, you were simply put in the bullpen and used accordingly. Uh, and as I say, I think I was one of the first, if not the first, to be groomed at Seattle in 1961 by Johnny Pesky to uh, be a relief pitcher in the big leagues. Well, that's five strikeouts in a row for Raditz. He's got that Hummer working again now. His fastball was enhanced by his size, for Raditz was a menacing figure on the mound. Oh, I think I was, you know, just if nothing else, the size alone. I, uh, back when I was in shape, 6'6", 250 pounds, and, uh, and yeah, I had the good fastball, and, uh, and it had a lot of movement on it, and I, I think uh, there was some intimidation there, if nothing else, with the size alone and the velocity of the pitch. He's about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, weighs 240. A lot of nicknames given Raditz, the White Whale, Frankenstein. Right. Now one that seems to be sticking is the monster. Mickey Merrill gave that to me in uh, New York one day when I struck him out with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning. And, uh, there were a few four-letter adjectives that preceded it and some after it, too, but Monster was in the middle of it. And uh, he yelled it so loud that the press heard him, and they picked up on it, and hence the nickname became uh, became sort of a household word around here in the Boston area, and it's, uh, it's, it stayed with me up until this very day. In 1963, Dick received an All-Star Game invitation and some welcome advice from veteran Elston Howard. He was a tremendous help to me in those games. You know, he was an old war horse. He's been around the block a few times. He says, kid, you got all it takes to, to do well in this game, so don't be scared. I said, well, I'm not scared, Ellie. I said, I'm a little nervous. He said, that's good. He said, I'll take care of the rest, and he did. His second All-Star game in 64 was not so memorable, thanks to a photo finish and a filly. Johnny Callison was the only guy I faced twice in the game. First time up, he got my attention. Long fly ball to Mickey in center field. He hit it pretty good. K 
came up the second day, I got about halfway home plate, and he went back to the dugout and changed bats. He got a lighter bat as I found. I got Hank Aaron's bat. Hank's on a real light bat. First pitch I threw him, I tried to get him, I tried to back him off the plate a little bit, left-handed hitter, and then I was going to work the outside part, but I didn't get it in deep enough, and it was out over the inside part of the plate, and I don't know if it's landed to this day. He hit it pretty good. In 1965, Dick began to lose his fastball. He retired in 69, but can always look back on three monster years. I guess maybe for three years, those are about as good as three years as maybe anybody's put together in 62, 3, and 4. Do I belong in the Hall of Fame because of those? I don't think so. Now, if I had the good second pitch, be it a slider, curveball, maybe split finger that they do today, it would have been a help. I would have liked, I would have liked to have three or four more productive years than I had, but... Um, it was, it was a good career for as short as it lasted, and that's uh, something I'll never forget. After 30, life. On deck for next week, the Burt Shepard story. A war vet with a passion for baseball and the determination that nothing would stand in his way. Give it a try. Uh, there's nothing wrong with trying and failing, but there's a terrible, terrible thing wrong if you don't try. This is Warner Fusell. Major League Baseball Magazine is presented by Ruffles Light, Cheetos Light, and Doritos Light. Never give up the taste.